much has the Republican Party shifted from its core values? My next guest says a lot. Patty Davis is the daughter of President Ronald Reagan. She's a best-selling author and former actress who had a reputation for being a rebel. More recently, she's been an outspoken critic of President Trump. She believes her father would be horrified by the current state of politics in America. USA! USA! Today, we explore politics and life in a first family through Patty Davis's eyes. I want to start with the slogan, Make America Great Again, because it is a slogan that your father started. Let us pledge to each other, with this great lady looking on, that we can, and so help us God, we will make America great again. How do you think it has shifted from your father's use of it to what Tr President Trump is using it? I, I think it's taken on, obviously, a completely different meaning, because what it seems to mean now is let's make America white again, and racist again, and small-minded again. In your opinion, as the daughter of Ronald Reagan, what did your father stand for in terms of the Republican Party? Well, I think he definitely, he wanted America to be the best it could be. Now, you know, people can have disagreements on how exactly he thought that should come about. But um, he really did see this, city, this country as the shining city on the hill. And he wanted us to fulfill what the Founding Fathers wanted in what they call this grand experiment of America. Can you name a single recent US president you admire and tell us why? Well, I would say Ronald Reagan. President Reagan once reminded us that America was a shiny city upon a hill. Reagan had a vision for America's future. President Ronald Reagan said that what we do here is both commonplace and miraculous. How has the Republican Party shifted from your father's era to what it is right now, in your opinion? I mean, I'm not a Republican. I never have I know. been. Yes. But um, I think the Republican Party now bears no resemblance to the Republican Party of my father's time. Can you give examples about that? How about like the crickets when when Trump keeps assaulting the Constitution? The Republican Party now, particularly the Republicans in this government, are just sitting by the sidelines and letting the Trump administration destroy this country. I mean, they don't say anything. They don't stand up to him. But you're speaking up. I mean, you're, you're writing up ads, criticizing I the am. president. You quoted the Romanian dictator mm -hmm. uh, and him saying, you can do whatever you want if you keep the people frightened enough. Yeah. Are you suggesting this is what President Trump is doing? I think it's very obvious that's what he's doing. If you stir up fear in people, you weaken them. If you divide people, you weaken them. Everything he says is divisive. Look at his rallies. We don't have time right now um, or the room for people to sit on the sidelines. I think the biggest danger is people saying, oh, you know, the news is so upsetting. I just, I just can't handle it. I'm just too sensitive. You know, your sensitivity is the problem right now because if people don't speak up and stand up, we are gonna lose this country. I mean, that's what we're faced with right now. There are a couple of really great books out right now. One is called How Democracies Die. And it talks about that democracies, at least in our lifetimes, have not been destroyed from military coups and violent uprisings. They've been destroyed by a, a process of chipping away. That's true. And people get tired, you know, they get tired of this onslaught of news. They get tired of the drama. And that's when the danger happens. And are you suggesting President Trump is endangering our democracy? Of course I am. I mean, he is. It's maybe an unfair question for you because your dad has passed away a long time ago. But what would you think he would think about this moment? I think he would be horrified. Um, he would also be 108 years old, so maybe he wouldn't have a lot to say. But let's assume he would. I think he would be horrified. I think he would be heartbroken because he loved this country a lot and he believed in this country. I mean, that was in, you know, all of his speeches. And he believed in the goodness of people. 
Those who become American citizens love this country even more. And that's why the Statue of Liberty lifts her lamp to welcome them to the Golden Door. Not many people know that in your father's presidency, um, he passed an immigration law that allowed three million undocumented immigrants to become citizens of the United States. And I, I don't know many Republicans know that actually, or many people know that. I think they that. do. I think they all have selective memory at this point. And um, recently on social media, my father's final speech before leaving office was being sent around. He spoke about this, you know, beautiful, this door where anyone who had the heart and the will to come here should be able to come here. I mean, it was totally the opposite from these brown people who are bringing diseases and raping our women and women with duct tape and whatever else he's saying. What is going on right now is, is absolute cruelty. We're ripping children out of the arms of mothers and putting them in cages. And it might not be a top news story right now, but there are still children in cages who may never be returned to their families. This is not the kind of country we're supposed to, to have. How was it being a first daughter when your father was in the White House? Well, I hated it. I mean, I was 28 years old, I was single, and I was being followed around by heavily armed Secret Service agents. Dating is not fun when you're being ask. followed around by a small army of men Were you with able Uzis. to find a date? Uh, well, yes. Okay. But it was it was not it was not comfortable cuz I mean you'd be at a restaurant and you know there they'd be. And then, you know, if you were seeing somebody for a while then like the first night that you maybe stayed at their place. I mean, you don't anticipate this stuff like, you know, that's kind of what happens and then so you end up with these like really awkward situations of kind of like pulling your clothes around you and going out to the sedan where the two guys are and going, hi, I'm gonna be staying here tonight. And they're not happy about it because then they have to call the next shift and tell them that they're, you have to be sitting in a car all night outside some guy's house and <clears throat> yeah. When Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980, it was the height of the anti-nuclear movement. His daughter, Patty Davis, was a strong supporter. She made headlines for protesting her own father's policies. And for years, there was division in the Reagan family. Many called you a liability to your father because you were demonstrating against some of his policies. Do you think you were a liability to him? I think I made a terrible mistake in expressing myself in the way that I did. I'd been involved in the anti-nuclear movement before he became president. I remember my thought process and, and thinking, here's this huge spotlight on me now for nothing that I have done, but there it is. And I can use that to help draw attention to this movement that I believe in. What I didn't understand at the time was the way in which I was doing it. It was just sowing, um, divisiveness in my family and and I was out there demonstrating for world peace but because of who my father was the only thing I was communicating was that I was at war with my father the best thing I could have done for world peace was stay home you know it was a big life lesson for me that the way in which you communicate something makes more difference really than what you're communicating because mm. that's what people hear and what were your biggest regrets my behavior in the in the 80s because you know, I did hurt him, and I I think it was embarrassing. And how did they handle that? Not well. <laughs> At that time? Like what? Well, they weren't happy with me. I mean, they, you know, I don't think my parents knew what to do about it. I mean, you know, we're not exactly a close communicative family. Maybe it would have been different if we were a different family, and they could have gone, hey, let's sit down and talk about this. Maybe, you know, you can <clears throat> say this a different way or something like that. But they seem to be very close, your parents, and yes. extremely loving. Yes. So there was a camaraderie between them, but not the whole family. Right. So my parents were in this bubble of the two of them, and everyone else kind of orbited outside of that. How did it feel as a daughter? It was like we kind of knew that if a tribe of gypsies came and spirited us away, they would miss us, but they'd be fine. 
How did they handle your own expressions of your identity and rebellion of it? Because you said you actually started with the age of 15 with drug addiction. Well, they didn't know about my drug addiction until way later. I mean, I went away to boarding school at 15. So I got into speed and through amphetamines, diet pills, and I was very skinny. Um, but I don't think they put two and two together. So how, what was the journey of healing for you and rehabilitation? There was one night when I actually did think I was going to die. I mean, my heart was beating so fast that I, I, I really did. I thought I was going to die. And I just prayed. And I, um, oh, it makes me emotional now. Um, I just, I knew that God did not put me on this earth <laughs> to die of a cocaine overdose, you know. And I stopped. I stopped cold turkey all by myself. I never went to rehab or anything. Wow. Did you ever tell your parents about that? I wrote an article um, in Time magazine sort of about that. I did call my mother and tell her. My, my father was already diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Mm. And I called my mother and told her that I wrote this piece and it's coming out in Time magazine, just so <laughs> she would know. And she was very moved by it. And she said, I wish I had known, you know, I wish I'd known that it was that bad. When Davis was 41, the rebellious former first daughter posed nude for Playboy magazine. The cover was part of a larger campaign for the animal rights organization PETA. I do need to ask you the question about your decision to pose nude. Sure. I'm dying to know how did your mom react to this? You know something? My mother was not, I think if I'd done like Hustler or something, it would have been a whole different movie. But, you know, she was okay, but I'll tell you a funny story. Um, Nancy Sinatra did Playboy, and she was a little older than me when she did it. So I told my mother, I said, so Nancy Sinatra, you know, is coming up in, in Playboy. She looks really good. Her pictures look really good. And she said, oh, I'm so happy. I'm going to call her mother and tell her. So my mother and Nancy Sinatra Sr. were on the phone talking about Nancy Sinatra Jr.'s Playboy layout and that she looked really good. But they were not upset about it. Apparently not. Oh, wow. <laughs> we are in Women's History Month. Yes. And these are a lot of paintings yes. are by women, about women's issues. How women are speaking up is also a, a discussion, mm -hmm. right? Including on what is objectification of women and what is woman power, whether they pose nude or whether they pose in a, a sexy ways. Mm -hmm. Is that empowering of women or is that being objectified? As someone who have actually posed mm -hmm. nude, what are your thoughts on that? I think we have to be very careful as women to not judge other women. So if a woman came to me and said, well, you shouldn't have done that because, you know, that's objectification or something, I'd go, hey, you don't know my, you know, this is my body. This is what I chose to do. Maybe it's not what you chose to do, but we do have choice, you know? So I think we're not doing ourselves um, service as women if we attack one another um, for, for women making their individual choices. Recently, you wrote a novel. You have many novels. But this is my 12th book. Wow. Well, I've written fiction and nonfiction. So but. this one, though, it starts with a story about a mother dying. Yes. Tell me more about that. Um, so The Wrong Side of Night is, a, well, it's about a, a lot of things, but it does open with uh, the death of the main character's mother. The first line of the book came to me a couple of months before my mother died. I was working on her eulogy because I knew her death was imminent. She was not well. And I was walking my dog one day, and it was drizzly and gray out. And this line came to me on the first day of autumn rain, my mother died. And I just knew that that was, I was starting a novel. My first thought was, oh, I don't know if I want to go here in a novel. And then I thought, yeah, I do. Patty Davis had a tumultuous relationship with her mother, Nancy. She wrote and spoke about it openly and even mentioned it when she delivered her mother's eulogy in 2016. It's no secret that my mother and I had a challenging and often contentious relationship. When I was a child, I imagined having warm, comfortable conversations with her, the kind of conversations that feel like lamplight. 
the reality was far different. I tried her patience and she intimidated me. Who was your mother in your opinion? Who was Nancy Reagan? A complicated person. How so? You know? I don't know that I will ever figure all that out. And I think, I think part of what brought me some peace of mind is to stop trying. I think if you have a challenging relationship with a parent and you keep going, well, I have to figure them out. And I have to figure out, like, why, is, why, is, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? How about instead saying, what decisions have I made because of this relationship? What choices have I made? How is this factoring in my life? How have I processed this in my life? And start fixing things there, because that's the area that you can do something about. In your eulogy of your mother, mm -hmm. it felt to me that you were looking for the beautiful memories. Yes, absolutely. They absolutely. were not plenty. They were not, no. Really. And that was probably the most pivotal thing for me. And it was definitely, you know, I knew when I said, okay, I gotta write my mother's eulogy, I knew what I wanted to say thematically. I knew I wanted to speak to choosing to focus on the times when there was love there. And I could pull up a few examples in my life. You know, I was very frightened of my mother for really all, all my life. Really? Even was, as a child? Yes. I mean, that's, that's my constant thread of memory with, with my mother. Frightened because you couldn't appease her or frightened because... Did you ever meet my mother? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you had, you wouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> My mother was a very intimidating woman. Uh -huh. She could be. She could also be very charming, but she could be very intimidating. When my mother died, in the process of her death, she gave me her truth. Was there a truth that your parents gave you in the process of their death? I can't say that about my mother. My father, very definitely. You know, my belief about Alzheimer's is that someone's soul cannot have Alzheimer's. So when my father died, um, his eyes hadn't opened in probably like a week. And for, I would say, a year or more, his blue eyes had kind of faded to this grayish blue. Moments before he died, he opened his eyes. They were blue again. He was there. I mean, they were twinkling. He was there. And he looked at my mother, and then he died. And that was, to me, the validation of the belief that I had held on to for a decade, that there's a soul there in a, within a body and a mind that is fading or being nibbled away at by the disease. But there he was. It was, it was one of the most, probably the most profound moment in my whole life. It made me a little less scared of death. I read your uh, piece once saying, people don't know the whispers between a daughter and a father in, in his last breath. Do you have any regrets on your relationship with your father? The 10 years that my father had Alzheimer's uh, was, well, it was significant in so many ways, but I, um, I feel that I did get a chance to apologize to my father. Um, in this sort of mysterious realm that Alzheimer's puts you in. So I believed that what I was saying to him or even, even just what I was communicating sometimes in total silence did get through to his, there was a soul to soul communication. So I, I did feel like that I, I got to apologize and, that, and then I was forgiven. just days before the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford. Patty Davis wrote an op-ed detailing her own Me Too story. You wrote a very important piece about your own experience of right. sexual assault, which actually sounded more like rape. Yeah. Um, what took you so long to actually break your own silence about your own experience? It took the Me Too movement. I felt emboldened by that movement. I felt protected by that movement. And if, if that hadn't been the case right now, culturally, I would never have, I would have probably gone to my grave with that story. It was nearly 40 years ago. I felt that it was important 
to speak out and and say why women don't speak out because we feel ashamed. We feel like somehow it must have been my fault. Maybe I wore the wrong thing. Maybe did I give signals off or something like that, you know? Intellectually, we know that's not true, but there's what we know intellectually and what we feel emotionally. I never told anybody, you that know? I never told my boyfriend at the time. I never told my husband when I was married. I never told anybody. Not even your parents? Well, my parents would have been the last people I would have told. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. Right. And your, I mean, what, what struck me when I read the article is you were already a daughter of a powerful parents mm -hmm. and a man particularly, mm -hmm. and that did not protect you. No. I mean, if that's what a man wants to do to a woman, I think the assumption is I have the power here. I can do what I want. Well, the assumption is the power of the man over the woman, even if she is a powerful woman herself. Right. His yeah. power is greater. Is, is greater. I want to take it back to where we are right now in the country because it's a divided moment. There's a lot of tension and there's a lot of emotions. Given your own history, your, your family, your own personal identity, what's your message to all Americans today? I mean, my first thought when you ask that is to say, be afraid, be very afraid. But I think that fear can be also be used as an impetus. I think we should be afraid that, that this democracy could be destroyed. Um, you know, if we just walk around and go, oh, you know, we've survived things before, we'll be fine. You know, that's like saying the Titanic can't sink. I mean, you just knew it was going to as soon as they started saying that. Every democracy can be destroyed. There, nobody is immune, and we're not immune. So I think there is a way to use our fear of this country being destroyed to make us rise up and say, no, 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 it's not going to be destroyed. Donald Trump did not win the popular vote. So there are more people who are concerned about this country and feel it's going in the wrong direction than feel like everything's okay and we're making America great again. The problem is the people supporting Trump are a lot more vocal and have a lot more energy at this point. The rest of us need to have an equal amount of energy. And on that, thank you very much. What a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Thank you.